I think we moved in the right direction because we had an immediate beginning of cuts that will result in $917 billion saved over the next uh, 10 years. We set up a second um, point in this uh, process by which we have this 12-person uh, uh, committee. And uh, it is a committee of the House and Senate that it is made up of members of Congress, so it's still within the, the, the Congress because in the Constitution we can set up the rules of how we operate the House and the Senate. It is required to report to us by the 23rd of November a plan to cut $1.5 trillion before the president, and we have to vote on it or it has to be adopted, before the president can get another increase in the debt ceiling of a lesser amount. And if we don't agree to it, automatic cuts go into effect, both on the domestic side and on what's known as the security side. Originally they said defense, but it's Defense Department, Homeland Security, State Department, and uh, intelligence uh, agencies. Now, why do we do that? We made it so bad if the automatic cuts go into effect that most of us really won't want that to go into effect, so we will put pressure on the commission or the committee to do their work in an intelligent way and bring us a list of cuts that, while tough, would be the best cuts under the circumstances. And so it's really a kind of a, a, an orchestrated catch-22. If we don't have them do serious work, or if we don't adopt their serious work, the automatic cuts go into effect. On the domestic side, they're set up so that probably the liberal side of the aisle wouldn't like it. On the uh, security side, they're set up so that the uh, conservative side of the aisle won't like it. It's sort of a mutual uh, uh, a society of, of um, mutual sure destruction. Now, that, that's an interesting term. Uh, and then the third thing it requires is that we have a vote on a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. We haven't had a vote in 15 years. Last time we voted, uh, it was a time actually where Republicans controlled the House. I believe the Democrats controlled the Senate, although I'm not sure about it. Fifteen years ago, it passed by a two-thirds vote in the House, by more than a two-thirds vote in the House, which, which, is, which is what is required uh, for a constitutional amendment. It's, it missed by one vote in the Senate of getting the two-thirds, so it didn't go to the states. I just ask you this. It's not the perfect solution. I mean, I would never suggest it is. But do you think if we had a constitutional amendment to balance the budget in place over the last five years, we'd be in the mess we're in now? I don't think so. Well. Some may believe so. I don't believe, I don't believe so. I think it would help us move in that direction. So those are the things we did. Is it um, everything we want? Not by a long shot. I, I, I analogize it to this. It's like a 12 round heavyweight championship fight. We've just finished the first round. The taxpayers are ahead on point slightly. We've got 11 more rounds to go before we find out whether we're going in the right direction. The markets don't know whether we're going in the right direction yet. They're not, they're not assured that we are. The um, agencies that come in and do ratings aren't sure that we're going to do this. In fact, they said we have to have a credible plan, ultimately, that will cut a minimum of $4.3 or $4.5 trillion over the next 10 years to show real evidence that we're on the road towards fiscal recovery. So that's where we are. A whole lot of other issues out there, I know, but it seemed to me that was the biggest issue of what we had done in Washington recently and where we are going when we get back there on the 7th of September. And thought, so I thought I would present that to you. Be happy to take any questions that you have now. We do have a mic. Is the mic working? Yes. Yep. All right. Uh, and our intern is going to, he's going to earn his pay tonight. Uh, so questions? Yes, sir. I would say I was a little disappointed in the final resolution. I understand it has to be a compromise, but I just, there's some things in there that just don't ring true to me. One, we have a super uh, committee or commission, whatever it's called. I personally kind of like what Gingrid said. I think it's a, a stupid idea. And I'll tell you the reason why. It's because I think that the people on the left, the progressives, have a lot to gain by not having an agreement much more than we do. I'm a conservative. So if we don't have an agreement, all these quote-unquote Jacronian cuts go into effect on, on the defense side. That would make the left happy. They would also be happy if those social cuts got, because the Republicans are now throwing grandma under the bus. And they're going to run that leverage during the election. So I think 
their stake in the game is to not come to any kind of a compromise. The other thing is, um, we had the Simpson Committee. There were a lot of recommendations, but nothing came out of that. It was rejected point blank. And it seems like there are some taboos that nobody's really wanting to talk about here that need to be talked about. And another thing, too, that bothers me is why I hear about cuts, cuts, cuts. And it's always a cut against a projection. And the problem that I have now is I would like to know what the absolute numbers are because our debt is getting so high. Uh, you know, what do you do? We, we, in 10 years, we'll be 26 trillion instead of 28 trillion. So the question really is, what's our debt going to be at the end of next year, and the year after that, and then how much debt is too much? Because right now, people are not wanting to buy our debt. So the other option is print more money. Well, I'm retired, folks. I've got so much money in the bank. Guess what? That money's going to go down in value because you print more money, it becomes uh, deflated. Correct. So we're in a bad spiral. I just, I just don't think this was, if you will, an outcome that really solves problems. Well, if you're asking the question, is it an outcome which ultimately or by itself uh, solves the problem, you're absolutely right. No. Is it the first evidence of the fact that we are on the road towards doing that? I would say yes. Uh, look, my side of the aisle controls one half of one third of government. Uh, we can't dictate as to how things are going to go. We got an agreement where we are cutting almost a trillion dollars up front uh, without a tax increase. Um, we have a vote on a balanced budget constitution amendment, which in my judgment keeps the issue front and center to the American people so that not only this year, but next year, it will be a reason for them making determination as to how they vote. Frankly, that's the way our system works. In the past, we haven't had the seriousness of the discussion. So I think we have made progress in this. Do I like this as a super uh, committee? No, I don't like this super committee. Um, if those cuts go into effect, I guarantee you the left, as you described it, will not like the domestic cuts. I, I guarantee you. Now, it doesn't throw grandma under the bus. It uh, has some protections in the area of uh, you know, the most uh, uh, sensitive um, uh, programs because um, that was the agreement that they had to get. For instance, the Medicare, Medicare is in fact uh, on the table with the cuts, but not, but only with respect to cuts for the providers. Now, I happen to think that's important, uh, providers, doctors, hospitals, etc., uh, but uh, not the other elements uh, of that program in terms of what the beneficiaries uh, receive. But if you look at all the cuts uh, domestically, I guarantee you those on that will not be happy. On the, uh, those of us on the conservative side who are very concerned about uh, the defense of the nation, uh, no, we won't like those cuts, and I think it will set up a debate on where we put some of the money back uh, for defense uh, and make cuts to offset it on the other side. Uh, frankly, I think that's one where the American people uh, will say, look, we, we have to think it was between making sure we have maintain appropriate defense and making some cuts over here in some domestic areas, I think they will go with um, increasing some of the, or putting back some of the money in defense and making the tough choices on the area of uh, domestic policy. Uh, so I, look, again, it's not what I would have written. It, it's not the final word. It does not solve the problem. It puts us on a track towards that. And the very fact that it dominates this debate right now, it seems to me is very, very important. We need to put the responsibility and accountability where it belongs. And that is our decision makers in Washington, D.C., with respect to the kinds of irresponsible spending they've had in the past, and have they learned the lesson, are we going to go in the right direction? I am absolutely with you on the question about printing more money. And I've been singing this song for the last five years. Uh, I've been to briefings with Mr. Bernanke, and he said, well, we're not going to have inflation uh, because uh, it's not the... It's not the um, volume of uh, money that's printed, it's the volatility of the money. And I said, what the heck is that? It means whether the money's actually being used and going through the system. Well, if it's not going through the system, the system's on its rear end. When it starts going through the system and the economy's moving, unless you have a tremendous upsurge in the creation of new goods and services relative to the amount of money that's out there, you're absolutely right. Inflation's going to rain. I'm very, very concerned about it. Here's the other thing. There's an insidious uh, temptation 
on the part of government to inflate their way out of their own debt. Because if they print more dollars, then the debt they have out there is more easily taken care of. The problem is, while it helps the government, it hurts you. And we have to understand that, and I think we have to fight against it. Uh, let's get somebody in the, in the middle here. Gentlemen, who I'll take some folks in the back and in the front. Thank you. Let me ask you um, to comment on two questions. The first one is with respect to the uh, promised cuts. My understanding is that the bulk of those cuts are in the future. As I recall, when President Reagan agreed to a tax increase in exchange for promised cuts in the future, they evaporated. What guarantee do we have that the cuts that were promised us will ever materialize? In other words, I think you really settled for a, a piece of pie in the sky by and by, and I don't think it's going to happen. Second question. Well, let me ask the first one first. Then. Okay. Um, we insisted that the cuts begin immediately, and the cuts um, change the nature of the spending of programs that are still scheduled to continue, so that as they are projected to spend in the future, you get greater cost savings because we brought the spending levels down to the baseline now. If we had waited for the cuts to begin to go into effect in two or three years, what you say is is true. That's why we fought so hard on it. Uh, if you look at what we did with the cuts in the first CR, continuing resolution, when people said, hey, it's only going to be worth $37 billion in the next 10 years, now it's projected to be $100 billion because we had those cuts go into effect immediately, and we then recalculated, because the immediacy of the change in the spending pattern, that those would be the uh, revenue uh, savings, or I mean, uh, uh, spending savings. All are we skeptical? Um, second, the second that's question. What fought, that's what we fought so much over. I mean, no, I, I, I appreciate it. Do we do it now or do we do it later? The president was saying later. We're saying we got to do it now. And I would say this: these are discretionary area of discretionary spending. That's not where the big money is, and where we're going to have to do some serious, um, honest debate and decision. Because you're talking about the mandatory spending programs. That's where we really do have to achieve some reforms in order to not only save those programs, but to get the deficit down. Well, well I, you know, I, I hope it happens the way, the way it's supposed to. I'm just, my experience suggests that it's... Well, I'm skeptical. We're supposed to be skeptical. We're Americans. We just shouldn't um, be cynical. Second, the second issue is really kind of related to the first issue in, in terms of the present, present value of cuts. Um, as too many of us know, there is horrible unemployment. My question is, in the last couple of years, what kind of layoff rates have there been in federal government? How has federal, the number of federal employees changed in the last couple of years? And I'm thinking in particular of, programs. for example, I fly occasionally. I really don't think TSA saves anything. Um, but there's a ton of them. A thousand standing around, um, and so you know when the president talks about shared sacrifice, it would be nice if some of that sacrifice came in the real practical, tangible thing of federal people looking for work too. Well, I can tell you specifically with respect to the Congress, uh, because I happen to be chairman of the House Administration Committee, we're responsible for the budgets of the uh, of the members of the committees and the leadership. Uh, I brought the first uh, spending bill to the floor this year, where I brought a cut of 5% across the board for every member of Congress uh, and their staff, for all the committee staffs, and for the leadership. Uh, just uh, three weeks ago, uh, I brought, uh, uh, I supported an effort to cut uh, further this coming year, 6 6.39 or almost 6.4% for members staff um, what I'm talking about is the total allotment of expenditures, that's real money, uh, for our staffs, for committee staffs, for leadership staff. So uh, in the course of uh, two years, I brought to the floor a spending cuts of around 11% directed at the Congress itself. In addition, uh, we have worked to um, 